Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with uh, Cecilia Naon, who is Argentina's ambassador to Washington. Madam Ambassador, thanks for joining me today. It's my pleasure, thank you. Um, I wanted to discuss uh, where we stand today with the um, debt restructuring issues that have been um, going through our court system for almost a decade. I think to start with, maybe it would be useful to provide some historic context. Um, if I understand correctly, in 1991, a currency board was set up that which effectively pegged the peso to the US dollar effectively meaning that uh, the central bank issued uh, a fixed number of pesos uh, depending on the, the U.S. dollars flowing into the country. Um, that lasted for almost a decade. Um, Argentina's exports at a certain point began to slow down. The country became mired in recession and in 2001 it made the decision to break the peg. Is that uh, a, a fairly accurate uh, historical uh, recounting of the, the situation? I think it is, Marshall. As you mentioned, Argentina during the 90s was the poster child of neoliberalism. We went through a very extreme package of neoliberal policies that involved trade liberalization, labor flexibility, privatization, that was uh, very damaging for the country. And as you point out, it wasn't unique. I mean, Mexico went through this. Uh, at least um, 15 or 16 other countries adopted the peg, and, and as you point out, it was the uh, policy flavor du jour uh, from the IMF, the so-called Washington Consensus. And yet, uh, despite doing all the right things, Argentina's economy did not do particularly well in the 1990s, at least the latter part. No, it didn't. Uh, growth was really very unstable and tend to be very low. And at the last uh, part of this process, since 1998, Argentina went through a very long and severe recession that ended up in the default. What was really important about this time in relation to debt is that to be able to sustain the convertibility regime, Argentina had to get into more and more foreign debt. So Argentina became a very over-indebted country. Our GDP to debt ratio at, in 2002 was 166 percent. So Argentina was one of the more indebted countries in the it was world. A bit like the levels that Greece is at today, for example, to put it, it in, in historic context. It was very severe, and Argentina in 2002 was forced to default. But I think what that was important is that Argentina not only defaulted in 2002 to its foreign debtors, it's also defaulted to its people. The convertibility regime in Argentina represented one of the most severe periods in our time in terms of job creation. We lost a lot of jobs and employment rates in 2002 were over 25 percent. Poverty got to a really historical, historically high level. And our industrial capacities were absolutely destroyed. We really became uh, and, and went back in terms of our manufacturing capabilities. So all in all, that period ended up with a very severe political, economic, social crisis in Argentina. And so effectively, uh, the country finally said, look, uh, no mas, we can't continue with this. Um, we, we, we have to come up with some sort of debt restructuring proposal. Uh, because there is no way we can continue to service our dollar-denominated debt. Because in that period, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, well, the currency went into free fall, and of course your cost of um, uh, servicing, particularly the U.S. dollar-denominated debt, uh, became enormous. Well, the, the specificity of Argentina in terms of the convertibility mm -hmm. regime was really very unique, and it was very unsustainable. So mm -hmm. that all collapsed in 2001, 2002, but a new period for Argentina started in 2003. I think we learned our lessons, and one of the most important lessons that we learned is that to be able to serve our debts, to pay our debts, they had to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. We needed to grow. So we put in place in 2003 a proposal that was negotiated for a few years to uh, restructure our debt, and it was finally restructured with 92.4% of our creditors. Mm -hmm. And what's really key in this restructuring is that it was based on our payment capacity. Mm -hmm. So we restructured our debt, making sure we could pay it in the future. We offered creditors GDP-linked bonds, which basically meant that if Argentina grew, they would have a better interest rate, a better payment. And in fact, Argentina grew. For the last 10 years, Argentina has been growing and it's at a 6% rate. It's interesting because that is precisely the proposal that uh, the Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, has proposed to the, uh, the so-called Troika in Europe. So they have obviously looked at the Argentina experience. Well, I think Argentina was very effective and very successful in the way it restructured its debt. 
As I said, 92.4% of our creditors accepted the deal in 2005 and 2010, and we've been serving our debt since then, making it a really very important case of moving from a very difficult debt to a very sustainable situation. Now our debt, if it was 166% in the past to GDP, now it's 40%. Our debt with foreign creditors in foreign currency is less than 9%. However, mm -hmm. a very small group of what are globally called vulture funds decided not to take Argentina's debt restructuring. They have decided not to negotiate to Argentina and to litigate against Argentina. They didn't accept the proposal that Argentina made because they wanted, and they still want, to have a highly privileged treatment. They effectively want to get paid out at par. Exactly. They didn't, they want basically to have not only par plus all the interest that have been accumulated uh, during these years. And basically this means if Argentina did that, to consecrate inequality amongst creditors. But basically what's more severe is that they have brought their case to New York, to the United States. And last year, as you know, uh, their ruling in, against Argentina was confirmed, giving them, given this very small minority of creditors, the possibility to block the payments to the other 92.4% of Argentina's creditors. That's a very important creditors. point, so I want to just highlight that uh, because there is a, a general impression that Argentina has become a scofflaw, that it is refusing to pay its creditors, when in fact, uh, as you pointed out, uh, they've secured agreement with about almost 93% of the creditors. And um, you have, in fact, been paying out, making payments into an escrow account. And my understanding is that that money cannot be distributed until you have a, a resolution with this, um, with this particular hedge fund, which are NML Holdings, uh, for, the, for the record. Mm. Exactly. This is the first pay, the first time in history that a country has the resources to pay its creditors, wants to pay in creditors, in fact paid its creditors, but because of a ruling that has been granted in the U.S., asked by vulture funds, our creditors, our good faith creditors cannot collect their payments. This is a really game changer in sovereign debt markets and I think this is the reason why it has created so much international discussion, so much international concern because this is not good not only for Argentina's creditors who are not being able to collect their money, I think this shows a major flaw in the international financial system. Yes, because in fact you, you can't come to an international agreement if, if one or two renegades uh, resort to national courts to uh, subvert internationally agreed rules. For example, my understanding is that many of these bondholders, uh, there are provisions within their agreements that the uh, negotiations and the resolution of in the event of any dispute would go through the UK court, so, so uh, London would be the final um, jurisdiction, and yet that in effect has been subverted by this act of what, what we could call judicial imperialism. <laughs> Well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a bit weighted, but uh, it's yeah, no, I think I think that's a that's a nice a nice term to to put it. What's really happening here is that a judge in New York has overstepped his jurisdiction. He has ruled not only on New York issued bonds, so American issued bonds from Argentine origin, but also on UK law bonds, on Japan law bonds. So basically, what's going on here is that a sovereign country paid its creditors who are in the U.S., in Japan, in Europe, and an American judge has blocked the collection of those payments. That's pretty unfair, not only for our creditors who we want to pay and we have kept on paying, but I think, it, as I said, I think it shows a problem that goes far beyond Argentina and that needs the international community to get involved. In fact, in the last year, the international community, the international uh, leaders have shown severe concern about these predatory practices from, from these vulture funds because you just cannot allow a minority really of uh, very extreme and aggressive uh, vulture funds to sabotage the restructurings of countries in the future. As you know, sovereign debt restructurings are part of the functioning of the financial system. We went through that in 2002. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We recovered from our restructuring and we have been able for the last 12 years to normalize all and every of our debts. Since 2002, Argentina 
solved one after the other all our debt problems. The only issue that has still not been solved because of the unwillingness of the vulture funds to negotiate and to really find a solution to this is that very small part that is being held by these very aggressive uh, funds. I think there's a very important consensus globally that this is a problem, and that vulture funds are a problem. My understanding as well is that um, was NML one of the original bondholders when, when the, the debt was first issued, or did they buy it on the secondary market afterwards? Well, absolutely not. These uh, vulture funds have developed a modus operandi in which basically they get in the secondary markets well after default, uh, stress assets that are already in default or are up to, right up to getting into default, just to litigate for full payment plus interest to get unwarranted extraordinary profits. In the case of Argentina, they expect a return of 1600%. This is what they are looking for. And this is not only something that happened to us. You know that they have had a, around 30 years history of harassing, trying to extort countries all around the world because they combined these very aggressive litigation practices also with very strong PR campaigns trying to defame the countries, to extort them, to put pressure on them, to force them to accept these very unfair deals. So they have done this all throughout Latin America, in Africa, they did this also in, in, in Greece. But what's important here is that in our case, there's an international process that has been started and there's international discussion that is going on. Mm -hmm. Because it was pretty clear that this is not only about Argentina, that this is a major flaw of the system, this is a major problem of the system, and that Argentina, in that sense, was very active in trying to bring this discussion to all the international fora to create consciousness of how the international community needs to address this to make sure that what happened to Argentina and that venture funds actions never happen again to another country. It's, it's, it's almost like as the only analogy I could think that's comparable would be that, say I have a life insurance policy um, and uh, for whatever reason I decide to, to sell it off to someone else uh, um, and the other person tries to claim on my life insurance policy when I die, even though he was not an original party to the, uh, uh, the, the, the policy itself, actually. And, and I th I, life insurance companies do not allow litigation in those sorts of circumstances. You have to actually have been the, the person who actually established the, uh, for good policy reasons, you know, you have to be the person who, who um, establishes the life insurance policy and, and, and to, to lay claim to uh, getting any kind of benefit. But here you've got a situation, as you say, where people are opportunistically scooping up the debt on the secondary market and um, effectively then um, uh, using uh, a form of judicial tourism to uh, in ensure that they can get some sort of uh, payoff. Well, what I want to, to make clear is that Argentina wants to solve this. I mean, we have been very clear that we want to find a solution for 100% of our creditors. It just needs to be a solution that is legal, that is sustainable, that it's equal, you know, that it's fair. So. And have we you enlisted the support of the other creditors who have been caught in this uh, particular uh, difficulty? Have, have any of the other creditors who already have agreed with you and want to get paid, have they uh, given you any kind of support in your... Well, Argentina for the last years have had the very strong support from many countries all around the world. The United States presented two amicus brief in the courts throughout this process. That was Treasury. The U.S. government, yeah, the U.S. government. And their, and their argument was it. that New York's uh, position as a major financial uh, center was being endangered uh, by this kind of um, uh, legal activism, if, if I understand correctly. Well, basically, the U.S. as well as Argentina and others have argued that the way the judge in New York was interpreting the Pari Paso clause in favor of the vulture funds was totally against market established interpretation and that was an, a very uncommon and extraordinary and unconventional way to interpret the clause. So, so where do things stand right now? This case was uh, taken to the New York court. Um, as you say, uh, the New York judge made a decision. Um, where uh, do things stand right now? Have you, been, you, you can't, have you tried to take this to the Supreme Court? Uh, my understanding is the Supreme Court rejected uh, an appeal, is that correct? Exactly. We took this to the Second Circuit and then to the Supreme Court. What happened last year was that the Supreme Court didn't take the case, so that basically made the, the case went back to, to New York. But I think that something very interesting that is going on now is that this case has created a lot of cross-litigation all around 
the world, I mean, which really shows, as we've said, that the ruling was of impossible compliance. I mean, basically, Argentina has been involved uh, during the, the last year in trying to find a solution to this in the terms that I mentioned to you. But basically what was uh, what happened is that a lot of cross-litigation started to take place. As you mentioned, very important uh, funds from the U.S. have taken this case to, to U.K. courts where they are suing the Bank of New York because the Bank of New York has not proceeded the payments that Argentina made. Mm -hmm. There's also more litigation going on in New York here between the Citibank and that is asking the court to see what if they can proceed on all the payments. So I think that one conclusion that we, we can take at this point is that this ruling, which we believe is of impossible compliance because it goes against sovereign rights and it's impossible for to, to implement, has created more litigation, has created more problems and has not really been effective to solve the problem, which again, Argentina wants to solve in fair, in equal, in legal and in sustainable terms. We are conscious that for our debt to be, for us to be able to serve our debt, it has to be a sustainable debt. But it is an interesting philosophic question. I think it's it's something I think that many uh, developing economies will have to consider in the future, given the experience that Argentina and um, other Latin American countries have had over the past few decades. Yeah, I think that. Let me tell you something that is relevant uh, in terms of the, the new issuances of, of debt at the, at the global level. One thing that also happened because of these vulture funds practices is that there's been, and it's taking place, a very important change in the way that countries issue their foreign debts, in the clauses that they include in their foreign debts. Because the reason why Argentina was under, put under this situation is because the pari passo clause was interpreted in a way that it was not established in the markets. So there's been, in the last year, More a lot of countries that have issued new debt with so-called vulture-proof clauses. And like Mexico, like uh, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, other countries have issued new debts under the recommendations of the International Capital Markets Association, which suggests and we think that this can make the debt restructuring processes in the future better protected against vulture fund litigation. We believe this is a positive step. We yep. believe that all you can do at the financial system to protect yourself from vulture funds is positive. However, there's a still a very important stock of $900 billion uh, in sovereign debt that doesn't have these so-called vulture-proof mm -hmm. clauses. So there's a still a very important stock of sovereign debt that can be attacked by vulture funds. And moreover, even if you consider this market-based approach to defend yourself from, from the vulture funds as effective, which we think it is, it's not the full and complete solution because, as we know, there can be judges all around the world no, and interpret you, those clauses. Uh, yeah, I think, an, uh, I think as long as you uh, uh, have a, a situation where you're borrowing in foreign debt and Wall Street is involved, you will never come with, with a full solution. And I'm sure that some sort of um, creative uh, investment banker or lawyer will find a way to try to subvert the clauses, uh, much to the cost of Argentina. But um, hopefully your experience has been a, a salient one and will help uh, other nations not undergo your fate in the future. It's, it's, ironic, uh, it's, it's ironic because you're in a situation now where effectively when you um, depeg the peso, you restored your national sovereignty, monetary and fiscal sovereignty, which had been subverted to some degree by uh, effectively borrowing in a foreign currency, which was the, the uh, effect of, of pegging the peso to the dollar. So you restore your um, national sovereignty, but again, it is being curved by uh, the actions of a U.S. Uh, court. It's, it's, it's quite an ironic uh, turn of affairs, actually. It puts you back in a almost a quasi-colonial position again. Well, it's, it's uh, certainly that what the vulture funds were trying to put Argentina in that type of situation. Argentina has been very clear that it will uh, defend its uh, economy, that it will defend its people, that won't take any decisions that really go against the debt sustainability and hence the sustainability of our economic growth process. For us, social inclusion and being able to, to keep our economy being a job creative, creation economy is pretty, is very important. So basically we are trying to address this issue as we have been addressing all our policies for the last 
10, 12 years, as you putting pointed, our people first. As, as you pointed out, it's not just Argentina. Um, I spoke recently to uh, Kevin Gallagher, who's a fellow of INET and, and, and uh, an, an INET grantee rather, and, and who has written a book on the reestablishments of some capital account regulations. And he has pointed out uh, precisely this case. Uh, he was in the United Nations with you, I think, a few days ago. And he pointed out that actually these types of um, uh, judicial actions subvert the ability of countries to regulate their capital accounts, impede uh, the ability to, to um, create a proper international system of, of, of capital coordination or any kind of co cooperation altogether because effectively you, you have one, uh, one fund that can effectively subvert uh, internationally agreed uh, treaties, for example. Well, you know that in the private sector, Chapter 11, or in every country, in the case of Argentina, when you restructure your debt and when you agree with a majority of creditors, and in this case, Argentina restructured and agreed with 90, almost 93 percent of its creditors, everybody has to accept the deal. So you can have a fresh start, you can move on, and you con can continue paying your debts and basically growing in the future. In the case of vulture funds, what they are doing is that they are abusing the lack of a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism mm -hmm. at the global level to try to make these very extraordinary profits. So I think you're right. This case basically is showing that there's a major need at the global level to make sure that financial markets work right, to make sure that financial markets are stable, are predictable, and work in a way that, that are orderly to guarantee that countries have the chance to restructure their debts and not be challenged and by these minority bondholders. And in effect, uh, you have been at the United Nations uh, precisely to work on this sort of proposal, an international debt restructuring mechanism. Argentina, I believe, has been at the forefront of that. Well, Argentina, because of the president's leadership, has taken this issue to all international organizations in which we are part. We have presented and shared our experience uh, at the Organization for American States, at the G20, in which we also got very important and strong support, at the United Nations, at the Mercosur, at the UNASUR. So in all international organizations to which we belong, Argentina has presented its case, has made the argument, and has received a very important support for the position, for the arguments, apart from solidarity from, from our for countries around the world. In the case of the United Nations, what happened is that countries decided not only to express solidarity and, and support to, to Argentina, but moreover, to move forward to try to fix this major lack of a system, this major laguna of the international financial system. So last year in September, 122 and 24 countries approved a resolution at the United Nations agreeing to work together in a multilateral negotiation process towards a sovereign debt restructuring framework at a multilateral level. And this is a process that is underway. This is a process in which uh, the first round of negotiations has started a few weeks ago. And of course, it's a very important process because it shows that countries all around the world believe that debt is important that sovereign debt restructurings need to be addressed. And this is not only because of financial and economic reasons. We know that if you don't have a sustainable debt, if the debt is putting pressure on your finances, then countries cannot afford the more important debt and the more important commitment that they have, that is, towards its people, towards its health system, its education system. So debt crises have been very negative for human rights yep. commitments as well in the past. So that's why I believe the United Nations and countries all around the world have found that this is a, an issue that needs to be tackled and that needs to be addressed. Uh, Ambassador Nolan, um, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been uh, very enlightening and uh, really enjoyed speaking to you about this. Thank Thanks you very lot. much, Marshall. It's Thanks. a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks.